Welcome to the Library of Congress National Book Festival. I'm Kevin Butterfield, the director of the John W. Kluge Center at the Library of Congress. The Kluge Center is one of the sponsors of this year's festival, and we're proud to help bring America's most beloved writers here. The Kluge Center works to bring scholars into residence to work in the collections at the Library of Congress for up to a year to write books like these and to be a part of the national dialogue. Welcome to everyone who is joining us live on C-SPAN today. We're proud to partner with C-SPAN again this year. You'll encounter a range of intriguing conversations on the inside stage today from the history of American spycraft, this first program, to an event about how our eating choices define who we are. We'll be hearing about climate change, the practice of interior design in black homes, what it means to be Latino in America. We hope you engage in the conversations today, ask questions, and join our writers at their signings. Our first panel today, Accidental Spies, The Scientist and the Socialite, features John Lyle, Janet Wallach, and Jeff Begays. John is a historian of science and the American intelligence community. The debut book he'll talk about today is The Dirty Tricks Department. Janet is the author of 10 books. Her latest is Flirting with Danger, The Mysterious Life of Marguerite Harrison, Socialite Spy. And our moderator, Jeff Begays, is CBS News Chief National Affairs and Justice Correspondent, also the host of the CBS News podcast, America Changed Forever. Let's welcome them to the stage. Hello, hello, hello. I'm not perky like you this morning. I don't, I don't know how you do it. I mean, I'll wake up this early for a tea time, so this is a little different for me. So forgive me if, you know, my mind starts wandering toward the golf course and I ask some ridiculous questions. And that's when you come in. You know, we want you to participate. Obviously, you're not gonna get this opportunity too often to speak to the authors of these incredible books. I think the Library of Congress has done a, a great job of matching moderators with authors because when I picked up the books, I was like, okay, spycraft, CIA, I like that. This is right down my alley. I mean, it's not golf, but <laughs> so. so thanks for coming, Janet. And John, appreciate your time. I loved your books. Thank you. Thank you. It was, it sort of reminded me of college where I had to cram to study up, but I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> I'm ready. Uh, so let's talk about the books. We're going to start with Flirting with Danger. I love the title. Um, I love the book, in part because it talks about Maryland and it talks about Baltimore. Not Baltimore, Baltimore. Baltimore. <laughs> and so it was really interesting to me. And then you have this heroine, right? This woman who decided uh, when it wasn't the thing for women to be spies, she wanted to be a spy. And she was a pretty good spy. Yeah. Tell us about Marguerite Harrison. She was from Maryland, mm -hmm. and uh, in fact, she was an eighth generation American from a very prominent family in Mar Maryland. Mm -hmm. And she was part of, well, she was a daughter of the Gilded Age. Her father was a shipping tycoon, and her mother was a socialite hostess who wanted her daughter to marry for money and for title. Mm, I want that for my daughters. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. Well, Marguerite was a rebel, so she wasn't so keen on what her mother wanted. Uh, she did have a romance with a Turkish bay, and she did have very dull dinners with Winston Churchill, <laughs> who stepped on her toes when they went dancing. Uh, <laughs> And she did marry a handsome stockbroker from Maryland, but he had more charm than money. Mm. And they, she was madly in love with him, he with her, and she had one of the most lavish weddings ever held in Maryland. And this was I forgot to say, she was born not long after the Civil War in 1878. Mm -hmm. So right after the wedding, well, nine months after the wedding, they had a son. 
<laughs> I did count. I kept counting. Uh. <laughs> they made it. <laughs> and they had a wonderful society kind of life. You know, the country club dinners and the charity luncheons and the special dances and all of that. All right, so why yeah, would she but, want to be a spy? Okay, all right. I mean, she seems to have a perfect life and existence, and why do that kind of dangerous she work? She did, but in 1915, her husband died very young. She was a widow at 37. She was very interested in world affairs. She had traveled as a child to Europe every summer, she spoke five languages fluently. At, at the age of 10, she was the family translator in Germany and in France. That's pretty impressive. She hadn't traveled at all with her husband. She was at home taking care of the family. When her husband died, instead of going back to the family to live with her father or um, her in-laws, she went out on her own. Not a likely thing for a society woman to do. She got a job at the Baltimore, Baltimore Sun Baltimore. as a, an assistant society editor. Then uh, when the war broke out as a reporter, and when, uh, and when America joined the war as a reporter, and she wanted to go to the front, no women were allowed at the front. So she applied for a job as a spy. Ooh. What else? Yeah. <laughs> and she applied first to naval intelligence because that's where the intelligence department was at the time. And they said, a woman? Not a chance. So she applied to the army that was just setting, setting up intelligence. There hadn't been a CIA, an OSS, none of that. And the army sent an interviewer who talked to her, and her German was so good that he was worried. Mm. <laughs> he said, how long did you live in Germany? And she said, I'm an eighth generation American. I've only lived here. He, he thought that she might be sympathetic to the Nazi exactly. cause. Exactly. Not to, to the Kaiser. Uh, the Kaiser. Where, we're time. in World War I. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and he, he was sure she was sympathetic. No, it wasn't true. And so the head of military intelligence, who had the wonderful name of Marlborough Churchill, love it, <laughs> said, you are hired. And she was the first American woman sent overseas. And she was a spy in Germany and in Russia and the Far East. So and hugely successful in her work. I, I kept thinking James Bond. Somebody needs to make a movie about Marguerite Harrison, unless there's already one out there. Is there? No. No? No. All right. Uh, any, no. <laughs> Once Hollywood comes back from the strike, <laughs> right. we can make a proposal. That's right. Uh, you I, I have to say, that the, the New York Times review, which I think comes out tomorrow in the papers, it's online, called her George Smiley in a mink trimmed coat. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So you mentioned OSS, which brings me to yes. mm -hmm. John's book. And, and for those of you don't, who don't know, OSS was one of the precursors to the CIA. There yes. were several different versions of that agency. Your book is the Dirty Tricks Department. Correct. I like <laughs> that one, too. You got my attention, flirting with danger and dirty tricks department. <laughs> So tell us about Stanley, is it Lavelle? Or Lovell, Le yeah, Stanley Lovell. Lovell. Mm -hmm. Okay, tell us about him. He is the driving character. Yeah, he is the main character in this book. Stanley Lovell is a chemist uh, from around Boston. Uh, um, he worked for much of his early life in just a shoe and leather factory, nothing that would indicate that he would get involved in intelligence agencies. Um, 
when World War II happened, though, especially after Pearl Harbor, he felt kind of a, a patriotic fervor. He needs to do something for his country. He happens to run into, one day, Carl Compton, who at the time was the president of MIT. Carl Compton knew Stanley Lovell, and he said, Lovell, you're a businessman and a chemist. We need someone like you in Washington, D.C. to help out. So Lovell quit his job right after that. And on his papers in the archives, you can see his stated reason for leaving his job. It just says war. So he left his job. <laughs> he goes to Washington, D.C. And he becomes an aide first to Vannevar Bush. And if anyone's seen the recent movie Oppenheimer, mm -hmm. Vannevar Bush makes kind of a, a few appearances in there. So Stanley Lovell's an aide to Vannevar Bush. Vannevar Bush is also from the Northeast. He has a similar kind of attitude to Stanley Lovell. And Vannevar Bush recommends Stanley Lovell to join the OSS. The head of the OSS at the time is William Donovan. Donovan is this war hero from World War I. He's the head of this organization now that's in charge of conducting espionage, conducting disinformation campaigns, and also sabotaging the enemy abroad during World War II. That's kind of the main thing the OSS is doing. So Bush recommends Lovell to Donovan. Donovan then recruits Lovell, we need you here. Here's actually how it happens. Stanley Lovell gets a letter saying, meet me at this one building in DC. He doesn't know who the letter's from. Stanley Lovell shows up to this building. He doesn't know why he, he's there. He doesn't know who he's meeting. He's led into some room that's, that's just barren. There's nothing in there. He waits for a couple hours. All of a sudden, William Donovan comes in the room, and he's got his Medal of Honor on his lapel. And he walks in and says, Stanley Lovell, I need you to be the Professor Moriarty of the OSS. <laughs> and Lovell is thinking to himself, and he knows Sherlock Holmes, Moriarty's the bad guy. You know? <laughs> but, Lovell, you know, he talks with Donovan through, and Donovan says, we need a scientist to create the secret weapons, gadgets, documents, disguises for our undercover agents. And so he recruits Lovell to be that person. Lovell ends up heading the R&D branch, the research and development branch of the OSS, and that's what he does throughout the war, creating these kind of gadgets and disguises. Yeah, I, I, I thought that was interesting, too, how um, how he had to reorient his mind from doing good to being as evil as possible. Well, th that's one of the main arcs of the book is Stanley Lovell is very reluctant to get involved in this kind of work in the first place. After Donovan recruits him, a few weeks later, he goes to Donovan's house and he says, I don't know if I'm cut out for this. I'm a scientist, and I, he felt a sort of Hippocratic obligation. I need to do good in society. Science has created good things. Lovell thinks it's created agriculture that feeds people and medicines that keeps people well. Now I'm going to use the knowledge that I've gained in order to create weapons that are going to kill people? And Donovan kind of basically says, just suck it up. We need someone to do this. <laughs> you know, this war is important. You know, you're going to help us. So throughout this book, we see Lovell's development, his arc as a character, from someone who's reluctant to engage in this type of behavior to at the end of the war, Stanley Lovell is advocating for the United States to use things like truth drugs on prisoners of war, to use things like chemical weapons in the Pacific, to use things like biological weapons. So it, it's a very strange turn how he goes from reluctancy to advocating for the use of weapons of mass destruction. Mm -hmm. It is, it, it's a dilemma. I think, for anyone who chooses that type of work. And of course, most people won't choose that type of work. Um, but what is coursing through both books is this sense of patriotism. Uh, from the characters in your book to the characters in your book. And so I, I'm wondering, you know, as I listen to you describe the book, the research in both of these books is, to me, meticulous. How much time, Janet, did that take? Well, it took me 30 years to find her. 30 years? Yes. I was doing research in 1993 in Newcastle, England, at the University Library for a book about Gertrude Bell who was the chief, the chief creator of Iraq after World War I for the British. And all her papers were there, thousands of letters and diaries and journals and so on. And I came across a letter that she had written home to her father in 1924, 
saying that this extraordinary American woman had come through town and that she had invited her to dinner and she had never had heard such tales from a woman and how this American just had everybody under her spell. And she invited her not once, but to t twice, to two dinners. It was the same thing. And I read this and I thought, an American woman in Baghdad in 1924, what was she doing there? Mm. She must have been a spy. Mm -hmm. That was mm -hmm. the first thing that came into my mind. And it stayed with me. I tried to find information about her. I couldn't. I wrote five books. Each time I finished a book, I would look for the next subject, as we always do, and I couldn't find anything. I hired a professional researcher, and she found nothing. Finally, I was determined after the last book, and I said, I, she can hide from me for just so long. <laughs> she may be a spy, but I'm going to find her. And I wound up fi uh, filing a FOIA request, Freedom of Information Act. And sure enough, her papers were in the National Archives right here in Washington. In College Park, Maryland, Maryland. Mm. and that was an, a fabulous, tedious, frustrating experience because it's, you're constantly filling out forms and, and getting permissions and waiting hours and hours for papers to arrive. But what I found in there was like gold. Mm. Indeed. So it was classified papers. Um, some of them from... Where did you find those classified papers? Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, I actually, I did take home Sorry, copies. I don't know where that copies. came from. <laughs> Just, what did you do with them? <laughs> Should we name a special counsel? <laughs> uh, just kidding. Yeah. Did, uh, <laughs> did you, but did you go into that process thinking, okay, I want, to look for a female spy in the early 1900s, or did you know Marguerite was the one that you wanted to profile? The little bit that I read about her told me that she was the one. I mean, the, she was, her, her whole viewpoint was as an internationalist. She really cared about world affairs, um, and that's something that has always interested me. Mm -hmm. Uh, she was really smart. She was beautiful. Uh, she was, well, charming because her governess told her, you can be intellectual if you want, but you'll get much further being charming. <laughs> Which, and there's a lot of truth, I guess, in that, yeah. yeah. Uh, and where she went and what she did, how she inserted herself into every level of society was fa absolutely fascinating. Uh, it really is, it really is. And Stanley Lovell is another one. He came, he was essentially orphaned, mm -hmm. and he found his way to Cornell. Um, was it Dartmouth, then Cornell, I think? <laughs> yes, yeah. graduated from yeah. Cornell. Um, so he really rose through, you know, from really modest means. Yes, he and he's not a household name. How did you find him? Yeah, yeah he, he was orphaned from a young age. Both of his parents died very young. He was raised essentially by his older sister, who was a seamstress, and put him through school. So he owes a lot to her. Um, but I found him through, I, I was researching my dissertation. I, I went to school at University of Texas. And I was working on scientists within the intelligence community. And through reading about that, I kind of would come across this name, Stanley Lovell. You know, he, he's the guy during World War II who invented the kinds of things like bat bombs and glowing foxes and cyanide pills and all kinds of stuff. And uh, I was intrigued, but, you know, I was focusing on my dissertation. I've got to research this thing. But every time I would go to the archives, uh, we were talking backstage. We spent a lot of time in the National Archives. Um, every time I would go, don't tell my professors, but half the time I would work on my dissertation, the other half, in the back of my mind, I knew sometime I'm going to write about Stanley Lovell. I've got to figure out. So I would pull documents from my dissertation, but also pull documents for Stanley Lovell and just kind of do that on the side. And so I, I did that throughout grad school. And um, uh, eventually I, uh, you know, finished school 
and I decided I'm gonna put the dissertation away. I'm gonna focus on this other thing. So I'm gonna hang out in National Archives full time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. For some people, it can be fun. <laughs> yeah, I see. I see. Yeah, so, so that's the origin, I guess, of how I found Stanley Lovell. I, I knew his name through researching just scientists within the intelligence community, but um, the story was almost too good for me not to follow up on. I couldn't hardly help myself. It, became, it kind of became almost an obsessive thing. I just wanted to know more about who he was, so that's what I spent a lot of my time doing. Mm -hmm. And the book talks about um, there was one quote, another, you know, when you work in TV, you hear things in sound bites. Uh, and I've been in TV for 30 years now, so when people talk, I'm like, oh, that's a good sound bite. That's a good sound bite. That's a good sound bite. Uh, and one good sound bite in your book is when someone is talking about, oh, all you really need are seven properly trained men to essentially do these dirty tricks. They can cripple a city. Mm -hmm which that's good information for a special report on CBS News, <laughs> honestly. Um, who said that? And it was that the thinking at that time as they tried to get the OSS up and running? Uh, that was kind of the thinking, especially for Stanley Lovell's branch within the OSS, this R&D branch. When Stanley Lovell was appointed to head this branch, he didn't really know what to do because the United States didn't really have the same pedigree in nefarious warfare as someone like the British. And so the first thing that Stanley Level does is go to England to learn about, well, what have y'all done in the past? And how, how can we kind of take some of those ideas and use them ourselves? For instance, one of the things that Stanley Level recreates is something called a limpet mine. This is a, a mine that a saboteur can place on the bottom of a ship and row away, and it's time delayed, so after a while it'll detonate and sink the ship. He got that from the British. But when he's in England, that's when one of his British kind of uh, counterparts says this thing about, oh, you need, you know, seven well-trained men are able to destroy a city if you just know the right places to attack. So that's where that comes from. Uh, but that's how Stanley Lovell got some of his original ideas from the British. And then when he gets back to the United States, a lot of what he's doing is just brainstorming. He doesn't have any direction, so his idea is, well, We'll just throw stuff against the wall, see what sticks, and see what these uh, soldiers and undercover saboteurs need abroad. And so they just create, start creating all kinds of devious inventions. Mm -hmm. And while your account takes place in the early 1900s or War One, yours is really 1945, mm -hmm. 1940 time frame with the Nazis as they spread across Europe and the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor, and Roosevelt was looking for, well, they, they were looking for as much information as they could get on the enemy, because the enemy, especially, well, Britain, of course, not an enemy, but they had their intelligence apparatus in place. The US really didn't. The FBI had been created, but in terms of intelligence gathering, which is, yeah, it's law enforcement, but it's a different kind of law enforcement. Um, and as nefarious as it sounds, you know, sabotage and dirty tricks, that's the way things work uh, in the intelligence game. Um, and so I wanted to ask you, Janet, and don't forget, I need you to ask questions too, okay? So uh, I'm gonna be asking for questions in the next couple of minutes. What do you want people to take away from your book? How extraordinary a woman this she was, and how women can do extraordinary things. Mm -hmm. Nobody expected a woman to be able to do what Marguerite did. In fact, from the time that the war started and we were thinking about getting involved in it, and we were worried about, the public was worried, who's going to earn a living for the family if we send our men overseas? And she went out and did jobs that men, only men did, like at the shipbuilding plants and streetcar conductors, and showed how women would just take over their husbands' or their fathers' jobs, and the world life would go on. And then, of course, she was one of the most important intelligence agents in World War I. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we can do a lot. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was almost like the, the enemy, well, it was. The enemy didn't see her coming. No. 
For sure. They weren't expecting someone right. like her right. in that kind That's of right. job. All right, who has a question? Right there. My question is Can you stand up? Yeah. Oh, there's a mic. That was my fault. I should have told you there was a mic. <laughs> Curious, uh, was it as difficult to find out about Marguerite's personal life as it was her professional life? Did she have to leave her son behind? Were you able to find out all of that information as well? Because it's just harrowing. And it was harder, in a way, to find out the personal information because her daughter-in-law destroyed all her letters home. Mm. Well, that tells you a little bit about her <laughs> relationship with her daughter-in-law <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and with her son, which was loving but very distant. And um, that created a distant physically and distant emotionally, uh, so uh, physically. So that created a lot of problems about, about Are you, are you but, sure the, the daughter-in-law didn't want to uh, destroy the correspondence? Uh, did they know that she was a spy? Uh, yes, by the time, this was much later. This was oh, the I second see. marriage, and this was much, much later in her I life. See. So she had told her family about what she was doing. But I was very lucky that she had two granddaughters who were around mm -hmm. who were very interested in this book and, um, and in helping to tell her story. So they were wonderful, and I did get good information from them. I see. Yeah. All right, right over here. Two questions, if I may. Um, Lovell seems like such an odd choice, a random chemist at a <laughs> leather factory. What was it about him that led them to think that he was the one that they would want for this position? And also, can you give us some examples of some of the nefarious gadgets that he designed? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, Lovell had a couple main things working in his advantage to get into this type of work. One is that he was from New England, and a lot of the people who were in Washington, D.C., in kind of scientific positions, were from New England. So he just happened to personally kind of know these people, like Vannevar Bush. Vannevar Bush was all, he, Vannevar Bush was basically the unofficial science advisor to Franklin Roosevelt during the war. Vannevar Bush was in, in charge of coordinating wartime scientific research. This included the Manhattan Project, proximity fuses, radar. So Stanley Lovell personally knew Vannevar Bush. So this worked in Lovell's favor for getting this job. Um, uh, as for the second part of the question... What kinds of things do you Oh, what kinds uh, of... Yes, exactly. Yes. Well, I, I mentioned a couple like bat bombs and glowing foxes. I can, I can uh, uh, briefly kind of state what these were. The bat bomb was this idea that instead of dropping incendiary bombs on, let's say, Tokyo, and they might not even hit a target, they might just blow up and we just wasted these bombs, what if we have bats we invent this tiny incendiary, we attach it to the bat, we put the bats in this artificial hibernation, we fly them over to Japan, we release the bats, they'll wake up, and then naturally they'll go and roost into warehouses and buildings and lumber yards, and so instead of wasting bombs, these bats are like heat-seeking missiles, they'll go exactly where we want them to, they'll blow up, and it'll start a fire and set fires in these cities, and we won't have to use as many resources. That's the idea, at least. It never got put into actual use in Japan, obviously. <laughs> but there's an interesting fact. It, it kind of worked, because during one test, one of the bats got away, and it flew into a military barracks in a, in a control tower and blew up and burned them down. <laughs> so, so it actually seemed to work a little bit. So th that's an, one example of kind of one of these odd gadgets. There were silenced pistols, and I mentioned cyanide pills, truth drugs, limpet mines, all kinds of different uh, uh, weapons forged documents for undercover agents this uh, department did, and also undercover disguises, so figuring out how to artificially age a person's appearance, how to make them look one way and not another, how to make them look as if they were a longshore fisherman in the middle of Europe instead of some American you know, agent. So that's what this uh, department was doing. You, in the book, you talk, I think it was Stanley Lovell who was asked, he was quizzed, uh, I, I forget who was quizzing him, but he said, okay, if you had to do this and this and this to the enemy, how would you operate as a, alone, a sole mission? 
Um, and what did he say? Yeah, exactly. So when Lovell was the aide to Vannevar Bush, Vannevar Bush was looking to recommend someone to William Donovan to head this branch. So Vannevar Bush gave a bunch of his aides kind of a test. And he said, basically, if you were stranded on an enemy beach and there were some guards that you needed to take out, what's the one weapon that you would want to have with you so that you could do it without anyone knowing? So Lovell walks around Washington, D.C., thinking about which weapon he wants to create. And he ends up submitting his answer, which is a silenced, flashless, automatic 22 pistol. And Vannevar Bush thought, this is exactly what you would need. So that is what gets Lovell recommended to Donovan, and that's one of the weapons they actually create. That turns out to be very useful. This exact pistol that was created during World War II that Lovell recommended, it was saw use throughout several decades into the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. Yeah, were there silencers at that time on, on, on weapons? Yeah, th this was uh, in one of the early silenced pistols. Yeah. yeah, okay. Interesting. And so, Vannevar Bush was like, hey, you're the guy for the job. Yes. Yes. I like the way you think. He liked the answer. Yes. All right, go ahead. Your question. <clears throat> this is for both uh, Janet and John. Um, did your protagonists uh, continue in their activities after their wars? And if not, how did they adapt to going back to civilian life? After Marguerite was in Germany and in Russia, where she was in prison in Lubyanka for 10 months, um, she went on to the Far East. And she was in Japan, where the Japanese wanted her to spy on the Chinese. And the Chinese wanted her to spy on the Russians. And the Americans wanted her to spy on the Japanese, the Chinese, and the Russians. Uh, <laughs> then in 1924, she was in Persia, where she made one of the first silent film documentaries on a nomadic tribe. And it was a death-defying trip across the highest mountains of Persia and through on goat skin barges, through rapid, horrible rapids in the rivers. So she did continue for a while. And then, like so many spies, she just sort of faded away. Mm. Yeah. All right, a question over here. Thank, thank you for, all for your amazing stories. I mean, I'm eager to read both of your books. I just finished um, at home, I just finished my binge of The Americans. Mm -hmm. And it makes me think of, and I think both of you hint at it, but I'm just curious. Did either of these individuals, you know, it seems like they were hiding in plain sight. Did they ever get exposed in, for what they were doing by the enemy? Uh, as for Stanley Lovell, not so much. Um, you know, he worked under William Donovan, this head of the OSS. When Donovan was appointed head of the OSS at the kind of early stages of the US involvement in World War II, the Germans um, put out some articles on Donovan saying that, oh, he's the spy master, he knows all this stuff, he has unlimited funds and blah, blah, blah. Donovan loved it because he thought, they're spreading disinformation, I don't have any of that stuff. <laughs> you know? So they're, they're doing my job for me. But, but as for Lovell, that, that sort of thing didn't really happen with him. Um, he, was, he wasn't a well-known figure at the time, and so not too many su people suspected what he was doing, and even if they did, he was working in the United States. He didn't get deployed abroad, he deployed people abroad. He's the one creating their um, disguises and cover stories and gadgets for them to then go abroad, so he was in the U.S. Uh, anyway. If I, if I can just follow up on that last question, too, about what happened to Stanley Lovell after the war, um, I'll just briefly mention, he did continue this kind of work in a way. He was a consultant to the CIA after the OSS, uh, it went through a couple iterations and then the CIA emerged in 1947. Stanley Lovell was a consultant to the CIA. He recommended to Alan Dulles that the CIA create a branch similar to the R&D branch of the OSS. Alan Dulles creates what's called the technical services staff and that's the branch would for CIA agents create their gadgets and disguises and all that. Um, there is an interesting parallel here. One of the scientists who eventually heads that TSS branch is called Sidney Gottlieb. And if you've heard of the infamous kind of MKUltra mind control program during the 1950s, Sidney Gottlieb is the scientist who ran that. 
I was looking in some of Sidney Gottlieb's papers, and I was hoping to make a connection between Stanley Lovell and Sidney Gottlieb. I wanted to see they're doing similar things at different times. Is there a connection between them? So I was in the archive, uh, taking pictures of documents, trying to take as many pictures as I can before I had to leave, and so I didn't really have time to sit there and just focus on the documents. I just was snapping and going, um, and I was looking at these depositions of Sidney Gottlieb, where he's talking about his work in the CIA, and in the depositions, I see the name Stanley Lovell, but I couldn't read it at the time. I, you know, I had to take as many pictures as I could, but I knew the name was in there, and so I was so excited. I know Stanley Lovell's connected in some way, uh, and so I eventually found what is the connection between this World War II OSS kind of veteran and this MK Ultra scientist. You'll have to read the book to find out, but it is there. No. <laughs> yes. See, in the news business, we call that a tease. <laughs> uh, look at this crowd. Golly, all these people up this early in the morning to talk about spy craft. I love it. Go ahead, Morrison Hotel. There you go. A uh, question for uh, the first woman spy. She was not uh, acknowledged at all um, when she approached the Navy. The Army took a risk on her. What were some of the early um, challenges that she had within the spy uh, community, especially in terms of, um, of the, um, na uh, the Navy? I mean, the Navy was all men. They wanted no women, correct? Right. And here you have a woman now becoming a spy for another branch of the Army. What was the level of acceptance or some of the frustrations that she might have experienced early on? Interestingly, she was part, as a, uh, you were Love. saying, mm -hmm. that of society that was patrician, well-bred, well-educated, Northeast, if you can put Maryland in that category. <laughs> we'll try hard. <laughs> and so she actually attended Radcliffe and many of the men who were in intelligence went to Harvard. So she was of the same class. And that did give her acceptance within the, within the intelligence community. I actually didn't see anything referring, in all of the classified papers that I read, and there was a lot of, I don't want to call it gossip, but remarks going back and forth about her work about how, uh, where she was, about what she was doing, how risky it was, some about how courageous she was, some about how it was just too dangerous. Um, so, but, but nobody actually referred to Agent B as, um, it, it, in, in terms of her, of her um, being a female. So she was accepted, but her work used her ability to engage with people from the higher echelons of society, as well as the hanging out at a bar, drinking beer with the workers. And when she was in Germany, she, she was, her job was to find out what exactly was going on. No Americans had been there during the war, because the war was in France and in Belgium. Nothing happened in Germany. We needed to know if we were going to sign any kind of peace agreement, how much, what the, what, how big was their military, how was their economy, how was their infrastructure, what was the mood of the people. That was her job to find out. And so she could be very close friends with former German army officers, generals, and she could be friends with the average working person. And that's how she got her information. Now, it so happened that she also had to be joined secret societies on the right and on the left with socialists. And within that group, somebody had a contact at the State Department who was a double agent. And that's how she wound up in Lubyanka. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. mm. Interesting, and, and John, in your book, you, you also talk about how, um, and again, there's similar uh, plot twist here in that a lot of the hires within the OSS 
were from mm -hmm. wealthy families, millionaires. Um, you know, these were people who could have been doing other things or nothing at all. Yeah, well, one of the jokes about the OSS and the early CIA was that it was composed of people who were pale, male, and Yale. Uh, so um, so th there certainly was a, a similar pedigree to a lot of these people. Um, there were a lot of um, accusations against the OSS, especially from people in military intelligence who didn't necessarily like the OSS because they felt like it was infringing on their turf. And so one of the jokes was that the OSS stood for oh so social because it was just a social club of all these guys getting together. Another was that it handed out so-called cellophane commissions because um, they were kind of see-through, like obviously it was so that you didn't get deployed and it kept the draft off so you wouldn't get drafted into the military. Um, so there was this kind of a, you know, social aspect to it that uh, especially people made fun of. Donovan, the head of the OSS, resented this, and when anyone would say that to him, well, one time there was an admiral in the Navy who mentioned to Donovan, you know, oh, this is just a social club of people. You're not really doing anything, are you? Well, Donovan goes and he calls up some of his guys in the OSS, and he tells them, break into his office and bring me his documents. So the guys <laughs> sneak into this admiral's office, break into his safe, they plant some dummy dynamite near his office, and then and they rush to where Donovan is at this dinner party. Donovan walks up to the admiral and says, here's the content to your own safe, and there's some dynamite next to your building, too. <laughs> <laughs> the dirty tricks department. <laughs> yeah. uh, thanks for your patience. Your question, please. Um, I'm hoping you read each other's books, because that's kind of where my question goes. Mm -hmm. I've only read one. I won't say which one yet. Um, I was just wondering what you thought these two people who were so involved in clandestine adventures shared in common. I'll mention something. Um, there's a, yeah, even the, the kind of to, uh, topic of this panel is kind of accidental spies. These are people who weren't necessarily the first person you would think of. A scientist, you know, becoming this uh, uh, dirty tricks department, you know, guy, the Professor Moriarty who's creating these devices, and uh, a female journalist right toward the end of World War I. But the more I've thought about it, I do think there is some similarity in that these are actually two people who you might suspect would go into this kind of thing, not just given their background. Journalists in particular are usually, are, are spies tend to use journalism as a cover. Journalists are people who ask a lot of questions. You know, if your local baker is asking you about what alloy you're using to create some kind of missile, well, it's gonna be suspicious. If it's a journalist, well, a journalist is just asking questions. So it's, it's a lot more easier to use journal, journalism as a cover for espionage. And it's similar with scientists as well. Um, this was especially prevalent in the, around the 1950s CIA was trying to recruit scientists to serve as spies because that's all scientists want to do is ask questions. What is that? What is that? You know, it, it's not weird if a scientist is asking you what alloy you're using. It's just part of the job. It's expected. Um, the problem that the CIA ran into with these scientists is that they wanted to talk about their work so much, it's not just that they would get information, they were liable to give it away. So they didn't know. actually make that great a scientist. R reporters do that too. I'm, <laughs> it's got to be honest. Uh, you wanted to answer the question as well? well I think that uh, John actually mentioned it before, and that was that they were both so patriotic. Mm -hmm. And they put their, they put their lives at risk to do this work because they believe in their country. Mm -hmm. And I think we, you know, that's, that's something that's worth, worth remembering. And, Especially yeah. today. <clears throat> yes. Especially today. Your question, please. How large was the context of spies? Like, how many spies were out there when Marguerite entered this work? And then, again, how many individuals were in OSS at that time? I, act, I honestly don't know how many spies there were working for military intelligence. Not a lot. Not a lot. We used, the, the, the military used their attaches around the world. The, they, they were the people who really were feeding information back to MI. Uh, and as I mentioned, Marguerite was the only woman who was sent overseas. So this was a small community. As, as far as the OSS, the OSS itself became a pretty large organization over time. It had thousands of people, thousands of personnel. 
not that many of them were actually in this R&D branch. The, the main component of the R&D branch is really like a dozen scientists, you know, who are, there's a, at the Congressional Country Club in Maryland, in the basement of the clubhouse. That's where they had a laboratory that they would create a lot of these gadgets. Um, so there, there weren't that many scientists involved with this. However, one thing that Stanley Level did kind of pioneer in a way is creating contracts to develop some of these weapons. So it's not just in-house that these are being developed, but he would contract out things to different universities, like Columbia University created the time pencil that would delay a detonation. Um, so it, it wasn't just the OSS personnel working on these gadgets either. It's being farmed out to other individuals who might have expertise in this specific area, but that you don't want to bring into the organization. Okay, your question. Hi, yes, thank you. As two people that have clearly spent a lot of time and energy on the subject, what is it do you think captures the American fascination with spies? And what got you interested in the idea? I, I don't think Americans are alone. Think about the British. You know, with the carré and go on and on and on with um, spy stories and spy novels. I, I think, in a way, every every country has its particular fascination. The Russians, by the way, were way ahead of the Americans in, during World War One in developing secret ways of spying. I think they were the ones who invented you or uh, discovered using urine to write uh, in secret. Mm. Yeah, not too lovely, but. Uh, I can't talk about that on TV. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think Draw the line right there. I think there is an inherent fascination with kind of espionage. I don't, I don't think it's particular to the United States, but I, I kind of see what I do not as that, but it's almost like a detective story. I'm, I'm looking in archives, I'm looking at documents, I'm trying to make connections, I'm trying to find letters that people are writing to each other. And the, the story of how the story is made itself is really interesting. But it's a similar thing on what's happening with espionage in that it's almost like a suspense. You know, what's going to happen? Where, are they going to get caught? Are they not? Inherent in the plot of any kind of spy book or spy novel is suspense. It's the thrill. It's the thrill of the hunt. That's kind of what you feel doing research. I might find something. I might not. You know, so I, I think it's more of a broader sense of just people like being in suspense in a story. It's exciting, and it, espionage tales lend themselves to that very well. Indeed. Your question. Yeah, I was struck by something that you said earlier about her dull dinner with Winston Churchill. <laughs> One, how does someone have a dull dinner with Winston Churchill? <laughs> and second, you know, was that part of her spycraft, or was it just socialization? No, this was her mother wanting her. <laughs> <laughs> her to marry the right man, and her mother knew uh, Jenny Churchill, who was an American. Winston Churchill's mother was American. Uh, how was he dull? He wanted to talk serious talk at dinner. She was a debutante, and she wanted to, you know, this was a point in her life when she just wanted to have a good time. He had come back from the Boer War, he had just joined Parliament. He was very interested in what was going on in Europe. This was not for her. It might, but besides which, stepping on her toes when they were there. Uh, <laughs> it, it might not have been a dull dinner for Churchill, but right. probably for right. her. <laughs> <laughs> All right, who's next? Thank you. This has been terrific. I'm still trying to process a dull dinner with Churchill. Uh, you too. <laughs> I just lost my question. Um, for, for both of you, and you mentioned a little bit about this, but what, what were the one or two threads that you just couldn't find or follow up on? Like what, when you wake up at night and you still think, oh, I just could have gone there. Would love to hear that. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll say that one of the chapters in the book is, is called the Documents Division, and it's about the part of the R&D branch that was in charge of forging passports and train tickets and ration tickets and all that kind of stuff. There is a part of it that talks about secret writing, which you mentioned earlier, urine or lemon juice or anything like that. There were a lot of famous chemists who were working on this. One is Linus Pauling. Linus Pauling is the two-time two Nobel Prize winner in chemistry and in peace. Um, but I just could not find that many documents on the creation of these secret writing techniques themselves. So that's one thing. If I, if I could 
find documents and later add something to this book, it would be more on secret writing because it's so intriguing, but I just couldn't find enough sources. The historian is kind of the slave to the sources. We can only write what the sources tell us, and if I didn't have the sources to, to tell that particular story, I just couldn't, couldn't put much, but that would be one thing I would want to follow up on. One of the things that I was uh, stymied by is that there's two kinds of intelligence. There's positive intelligence, where you're reporting on what's happening in wherever you are. So she was reporting, for example, on, on the political, social, economic, psychological of, uh, uh, situation in Germany. But there's also negative intelligence, which is counterintelligence. And that's reporting on people who are trying to undermine our country. And that was a lot of what Marguerite did in Germany and Russia. And she was involved with trying to get an American cartoonist, who was the most, one of the most popular cartoonists at the time, into American hands. He was, he was, a, so, he was a socialist. And she was told to track him down and pretend to be a, well, to do whatever she had to do, because they never given that instructions that are so specific. But she had to pretend to be a serious supporter of radical socialism, Bolshevism. And I never could get past, it didn't work out. It didn't work out. And he was actually, uh, they, they found, she found information about him that they could have used but the government let him go because his father was very influential. But there was a lot to that story that I just couldn't find. And, that, and she said that that situation caused her great problems for many years to come. And that's where that person, that, that uh, double agent was involved. So I would have loved to have had the specifics. It's very hard, as you say, to find those specifics. They, they didn't write about them. You know, they had to be careful. One more question. Uh, question uh, related to something that somebody asked earlier about you know, stories about spies coming out. And I think of Sonia Purnell's book, A Woman of No Importance, and Ben McIntyre wrote about Agent yes. Sonia, yeah. and the Code Breakers, and we have a lot of stories of women in World War II. And I wonder if you think some more stories of women you know, doing spycraft work in World War I might come out. I, it's possible. I don't. I don't, I think there are wonderful stories about World War I that are, that will come out. I, if they come out about women, they'll be about women who were working here, not overseas. And I'm, but I'm sure there are great stories to be told. No, no question. Yeah. Your questions. Uh, this is a question that's more about intelligence overall, since both of you have kind of dwelt on this. I just want to hear your take on the consequences in the long run of intelligence. Like thinking post Second World War, the US was involved in lots of coups, you know, think Iran, Honduras, Chile, et cetera, et cetera, that at the time were considered to be really positive results. But over the long run, you know, we see our relationship with Iran, and Nicaragua, et cetera, et cetera, is uh, doing that. And, and a lot of it has, you know, especially this like the dirty tricks thing. Um, is, just want to hear, think of your ideas on, on the value of intelligence in general. Mm -hmm. I, over the long run. Yeah, in intelligence itself, I think, is very valuable. At, at least the aspect of gathering information, that's what intelligence is, gathering information. And then typically, there's an analysis portion of that. So there's usually intelligence gathering and then intelligence analysis. That's very useful, just to know about what are potential enemies doing? What, how many troops do they have? Where are their missiles stationed? It's important to know that stuff, but there are really two aspects to the intelligence community the second one developed very, very early in the history of the CIA. This is now post-World War II. The CIA was created originally just as an intelligence gathering and organizing mechanism. It's a way to inform the president on what's going on in the world. Very soon after 1947, though, the CIA 
expanded its um, modus operandi beyond that, not to just be intelligence gathering, but to also be covert operations. So not just finding out what's going on, but also trying to influence what is going on. And there are a lot more probably negative to things to say about this covert operations side. The intelligence gathering side is kind of just a necessary thing in the modern world. The covert operations aren't just nefarious in some instances because they might have bad results abroad, but one of the things that they do, if they're exposed and they seem kind of immoral or unethical, is devalue trust in the government. The fact that our government would do something like this, it leads people down the slippery slope to then say, if they did that, then surely they're doing this. If they did that, then of course they would still be doing that today. This is one of the things when I study this MKUltra mind control experiment program, one of the typical things I see, especially in people who are kind of conspiracy theorists around this is, well, look, the government performed these unethical experiments on these people. Obviously, if they did that, then they're still doing something similar today. It's in the airplane contrails, it's in the water, it's in the vaccines. So it's easy for them to, to use that as an example of if that happened, then surely it's still going on. So it undermines trust in the government, which is probably one of the worst things that these unethical covert operations end up doing. I have a follow-up question. Um, you said unethical covert operations, but in the name of defending the country, is there a limit to what you should be doing? Well, this is one of the central questions that I'm kind of playing out in this book that I'm writing. It's kind of a continuation of this first book. It's really focusing on these MKUltra experiments by the documents I found in the Library of Congress. A lot of these documents are depositions of the perpetrators, thousands of pages of attorneys asking them questions. What were you thinking when you did this? Why did you do this? Didn't you think know that the consequences were gonna lead to people to suffer? Um, and you can see the gear spinning in these people's minds trying to think about why did we do that? And they have justifications. It's not that they're just completely unethical people who are doing this because they wanna see people suffer. That's rarely ever the case with anyone. It's very few people are just nefarious people. These people, Sidney Gottlieb, the head of this MKUltra program, he was, in his mind, a patriot. If the Soviets are going to lace or dose our drinking water with LSD, shouldn't we know what the effects of that are going to be? This is one potential that could happen. How are we gonna find out what those effects are? Well, what if we just do it on a small scale? We'll dose some people with LSD, we'll see how they react, that way we'll know if a city gets dosed with it, then we'll be able to, to counteract it, we'll know how to respond. So in his mind, he's doing something patriotic. I'm trying to prevent this catastrophe from happening. So there's a lot of rational justifications you can come up for this. So it is hard to walk the line between, well, what is ethical and unethical? Sidney Gottlieb certainly thought that what he was doing was ethical. He had the justification for it. He thought, he thought in the Cold War, we're in a war. If Stanley Lovell was during, doing this same stuff during World War II, I'm just as justified in doing it during the Cold War, mm -hmm. at least was his rationalization. Mm -hmm. All right, we have about a minute left. One last question. Very easy one. You, you have spent your career in the stacks, and you more recently. AI is coming along. How is that going to impact your research and your ability? This is a one-minute question. <laughs> okay, real quick. I don't think you can substitute human intelligence. The kind of work that Marguerite Harrison did, where she's on a, engaged in a very personal relationship with people who have information that otherwise wouldn't be gained. So, for example, the German of former army officers were plotting to go against any treaty that was signed and to create monarchy states, right-wing states, in Prussia and in Eastern Europe after World War I. She saw on the streets people marching, army officers in their uniforms, boys in gray jackets and caps, necks high, 
knees high, goose-stepping, on their way to stomp out the Jews. This is the kind of thing you need people to see and to know about. And no AI is going to do that. Uh, I'll just I'll mention briefly that um, AI will play a role in, in what the historian does when documents are, more documents are digitized. Until they're digitized, well, the historian still can go to the archive and see what's what. When documents are digitized, that's going to enable AI or search algorithms to find specific phrases, to find specific events that happened, and collate a bunch of information together from a bunch of different sources and a bunch of different archives that the historian would never have been able to go to on their own. Hopefully, AI can be used to aid the historian. Hopefully, AI or some language models don't just try to write history themselves. I would like a, a future where historians have some say in what they think happened in the past. Um, but it is, I mean, it, it, it's going to be a big deal, especially when documents get digitized. The fact that AI is going to be able to search them far better than any human historian ever could. Until that day, though, someone still needs to conduct interviews, which hopefully is where we come in. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect way to end, as you can see, from this near standing room only crowd. There's a lot of interest in your books. The Dirty Tricks Department, John Lyle, and Flirting with Danger, Janet Wallach. Thanks Thank you. for your time. Thank, Thank you. you.